All right, my friends, we're going to take a quick look at how you would linearize data for a high school science class or a college science class. Now, we all know that if we had this function y equals 3x squared, if you made a graph of y against x, you would get a curve that looks like this. Um, that's because, well, this is a parabolic function, um, so y is pro proportional here to x squared, uh, not to x itself. Well, so because y is proportional to x squared, what we might do is modify what we plot by, by plotting y against, well, instead of plotting it against x, we're going to plot it against x squared. Now, when I first teach this to my students, they're surprised that you can do such a thing, but come on, man, it's your graph. You can make it how you want to. So since y is proportional to x squared, when you plot this thing out, it will actually be linear. And if you kind of compare y equals 3 times x squared to uh, the pattern y equals mx plus b, right, the equation of a line, what you notice what we're doing here is we're letting x squared play the role of what is normally called x, or the horizontal axis variable. Uh, and so since the x squared is taking the place of the x, we kind of have this y equals mx plus b situation here. And you see you get a slope of 3. M, which is normally the slope, is, well, is now 3 is playing the role of the M. Uh, and notice there is no plus B, so there's no Y-intercept in this case. Now, in a physics context, you might have, say, you drop an object from rest, and how far it falls, delta X, happens to go like 1 half the acceleration times time squared. Well, so delta X goes like time squared. So if we plot how far the object has fallen against time, it is going to be another curve. It's a parabolic uh, like dependence. And so this really isn't the type of a plot that you're going to want to make. Uh, instead, what you would do, since delta x is proportional to t squared, right? go ahead and rearrange it and plot on your y-axis, put delta x, the distance it fell, let's say, and on the x-axis, um, put t squared instead of t. And so what's going to happen now is you'll get another line. It's a linear dependence because delta x is proportional to t squared. And if you think about mapping this onto a y equals mx plus b type format, now t squared is playing the role of the x. And so the coefficient of the x term, the coefficient of the t squared term, is now your slope. Um, so the slope is one half the acceleration. So this is a way to measure the, uh, say, the acceleration due to gravity if you drop something from rest and plot how far it has fallen delta x against the square of the time. Um, and again, we'll have a y-intercept of zero. So this all works because you're letting delta x play the role of y on the graph, and you're letting t squared play the role of x, or the horizontal axis variable, on the graph. Another common context for this, in, in physics anyway, in introductory physics, is if you look at a mass on a spring, and one might do an experiment where uh, somebody might change how much mass they hang from a spring, and then they would measure how that affects the period of oscillation, the time to go back and forth. Um, so the expected relationship is 2 pi times the square root of mass over the spring constant k. Well, if you plot the period t against the mass m, you'll get a square root type dependent. So the curve would look like this. Uh, it would be curved. It would not be linear. Because t is not proportional to m, t is proportional to the square root of m. Well, since t is proportional to the square root of m, you could rearrange the equation a little bit like this. Now it's going to look like uh, y equals mx, or t equals 2 pi over root k, and then times root m. So what you would do is on the y-axis, you would use put the period, as we did before, but now instead of plotting against m, you'd plot it against the square root of m. And so now it will be linear, and what's going to happen is the coefficient of root m um, is going to be the slope. The coefficient of the x variable, this 2 pi over root k, um, will then be the slope. And you notice there is no plus b, so this graph should have no y-intercept. Just for practice, so in college, you might walk into a lab and, and the person running the lab might say, hey, all right, today we're measuring uh, B and W, and this is the expected relationship, okay? Well, you would not want to plot B against W because you can see from this relationship that B goes like W squared as opposed to just W. 
So suppose somebody made a plot of B against W squared. Well, what would that happen? What would that look like? What I would do is rearrange it a little bit so that it looks kind of like Y equals MX plus B. So um, kind of solve it for B, but rearrange these terms so that the term with the X variable in it sort of comes first. So it looks like MX plus B. Well, the coefficient of your X variable would be 2J over 5Q. Um, so that would end up being the slope of the line that you would get. Um, so you would get a line. Uh, and the slope of that line would be 2j over 5q. And you can see in this case, we would have a plus b or a y-intercept of 8 lambda. Uh, another plot somebody might choose to make, depending on what variables you're measuring. Um, what if we made a graph of b against 2j over q? So you might want to pause this to, to think about uh, wh whether this would be a line or not and what the slope and the intercept would be. Uh, what I would do is rearrange it to look like y equals mx plus b. So there's this rearrangement of it. I just kind of pulled out the 2j over q from this term, um, leaving a w squared over 5 in the front. Well, so uh, this would be linear because b is proportional to 2j over q. And so the coefficient of the 2j over q would be the slope. It's w squared over 5. And then this leftover term would be your plus b, or it would be 8 lambda. Uh, so one final context that's good to know uh, about this would be um, when you have some kind of an exponential dependence. So this is an example of like an exponential decay. This comes up, for instance, when you charge a capacitor and then let the capacitor discharge through some resistors in a circuit. And so the expected dependence is an exponential decay like this. So if you plotted the voltage, say, across the capacitor as a function of time, you would have this uh, exponential decay um, type appearance, so clearly not linear. Um, but a way to linearize this thing is you can take the log of both sides and with that natural log of both sides, and that will bring down this, uh, this exponent. So if I took the natural log of both sides, I would get natural log of V on the left, and on the right, I'd get natural log of V naught, um, and then minus T over RC. Well, so the plot to make really is not V against T, but actually ln of V or natural log V against T. And what you would get in that case, if you put natural log V on the Y, let it play the role of the Y variable and let T play the role of the X variable, um, you, what you would get is a line um, with a negative slope because the coefficient of the T, which is going to be the slope, minus 1 over RC, it is negative. Um, so your slope is going to be minus 1 over RC, where RC is the so-called time constant. Uh, and this, in this case, we will have a y-intercept. Um, the y-intercept would be this leftover term um, ln of v0. Um, this is what's called a semi-log plot. You, you plot the uh, log of a variable against another variable. Um, and the reason this kind of worked is we let the natural log of v play the role of the y variable, and so we kind of have a y equals b plus mx situation. Uh, x is uh, the variable t is playing the role of x here, the horizontal axis variable. And then the coefficient of that horizontal axis variable would be minus 1 over rc. So that's your slope. So this is a much more useful way to present the data because you can actually learn something about the circuit from the, uh, namely the uh, time constant rc um, from the slope here. Um, so, th well, thank you all for watching. I hope you found that to be helpful. Um, you will use that a lot in your undergraduate science labs and in, say, AP labs in high school, this technique of linearization of data.